in this venue, Your Honours, in this venue, I announce my separation from the United States. In a speech to business executives in Beijing, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte said it was time to say goodbye to the United States and hello to China. For its part, China says it's ready to work with the Philippines on infrastructure projects under the framework of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Let's get back to our panel. And Richard, uh, talking about this economic relationship, let's try to put some meat on the bones here. Um, what does the Philippines get from China if their economic relationship is improved? Well, first of all, let's put things into context. The United States is responsible for around 13% of total foreign direct investment stock in the Philippines. It's a huge source of investments, particularly in the realm of business process outsourcing, which has provided millions of well-paying jobs. China, in contrast, is only responsible for 0.1% of total foreign direct investment in the Philippines. So in short, the Chinese are just trying to catch up with the investment picture here. So even though President Duterte has signed around $13 billion of, trade, uh, of deals with China, China still has a long way to go before it matches countries like U.S., never mind Japan, which is even way more important to the Philippines economically. So this is not about like saying, oh, U.S. cannot provide anything for the Philippines, let's jump, jump to China. It's more about the Philippines diversifying its investment relationship. Uh, so this is something that we have to keep in mind. Now, now, it is very true that infrastructure is a big problem in the Philippines. And when it comes to traditional partners like the United States, they have not been investing that much in Philippine public infrastructure. When it comes to Japan, they're willing to invest, but sometimes they're not as fast. Feasibility study take years. When it comes to China, we know they have this record of building fascinating infrastructure in a very short period of time. We have seen it in Africa, Middle East, and Latin America. I think that is what Duterte has in mind. More specifically, Duterte is looking at China building a bullet train between Clark and Subic, which are going to be the alternative uh, traffic uh, hub for the Philippines. And crucially, those were the sites of American military bases during the Cold War. He also wants the Chinese to invest in the infrastructure and connectivity of Mindanao, his home island, where there has been very minimal investment by traditional economic partners. So this is very much diversification. And I believe that the entry of China into the Philippine infrastructure landscape in itself is a positive thing. Why? Because it puts pressure on Japan and other countries to also be more competitive and offer more. So expect President Duterte's visit in Japan in the coming days will also come along with a huge tag price whereby the Japanese will also try to match whatever offer the Chinese have been made. So in fairness to Duterte, he's playing these economic giants against each other to gain more investments for his country. Young Xu, what are the benefits for China from this relationship economically? Uh, you know, China has initiated, uh, initiated uh, the one belt, one road. That the Philippines can uh, play a very uh, important role for bring about uh, bringing about uh, the initiative. Uh, given his very important uh, location uh, in the whole picture, uh, but uh, more broadly, uh, I think uh, uh, it seems to me uh, the Philippines has been adjusting their foreign strategy from totally depending on U.S. towards multi-dimensional diplomacy. So his visit, uh, the presidential visit uh, to China is a starting point to the adjustment. Finally, we will see uh, the Philippines will uh, conduct uh, uh, the equal distance with, uh, uh, super power, uh, with big powers like uh, China, U.S., and Russia and Japan with a different uh, uh, focuses. For example, in security, I believe Philippines uh, remain have a, uh, the closest ties with the United States rather than with the other power. But economically, they may have a closer ties with China than uh, with Japan. Now, uh, they, it's opposite, uh, let alone to with the United States. So basically, uh, the Philippines will, re uh, will rely on different uh, uh, type of relations with dip different uh, powers. In this uh, multiple dynamics, I think China, on one hand, will successfully calm down the tensions on South China Sea. That is triggered by, uh, jointly by 
Philippines and uh, the United States during the past. Now, Philippines turn around, and uh, that will make uh, U.S. in a very difficult position, position for the continuity of the South China Sea strategy. That is the benefits politically from China. Economically, as I mentioned, we will uh, benefit it uh, by cooperation for one belt, one road. Michael, what are your views on that? Do you also believe that the Philippines is involved in some kind of balancing act, delicate balancing act here to diversify its dependence on other countries economically? Absolutely, I think it is, and, I, and as it's, that's its right. That's, I think that's a good idea. That's what it should do. This is a country with many needs, particularly in economics and other areas. So there's nothing wrong with trying to have it both ways. Maintain its, its very uh, good relationship with the United States, both economic and also uh, security related, but also try to get more. Uh, and particularly from the uh, the Chinese who provide the particular comparative advantage and they can provide all these loans and investments for infrastructure, which as we've heard is a, is a very big deal. So in that sense, I think that this is a very uh, good plan um, by the Philippines. But I think that the ultimate issue here for the United States um, is to really realize that it cannot take for granted um, its policies in Asia. I think with what uh, sort of an indirect theme what we're seeing here is um, leaders uh, in Asia starting to wonder and worry how serious the U.S. really is about deepening its engagement in Asia with completing this rebalance, which we've been hearing so much about over the last few years. And I'm not saying that uh, Duterte, was, his, his objectives here were guided only by considerations of the U.S. not being serious about rebalancing. But I think it's important, particularly with the key presidential election in this country, thinking about po future U.S. policy in Asia and how serious the U.S. really is about engaging in this region so that it continue, can continue to have a significant role and be in a position where it doesn't need to worry about what's been happening um, with, with, with the, the Philippine president and his recent, his recent actions. Yeah, because economic relations notwithstanding, uh, President Duterte has used some pretty well, let's say, undiplomatic language to the, towards the United States in general, towards President Obama in particular. Uh, and he's also said that the Philippines has gained little from its long alliance with the United States. Is he right? I can't see why that would be right, uh, given all of the, the support and the assistance that the United States has provided over the years. I do think that in some of this, these things he's been saying is trying to play to the gallery, so to speak, um, cater to those in the Philippines that may be unhappy about any sort of perception that the Philippines is too dependent on the United States, even though, as we heard previously, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pro-American sentiment in, in the Philippines, other than some, some fringe uh, representation, et cetera. So I do think that we, we, we do need to take some of what he says with some uh, heaping grains of salt. Richard, it seems that President, go ahead, you want to say something, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah, the thing is this, to be fair to President Duterte, of course, there's no excuse for expletives. And in fact, in this visit to China, we saw that he can be actually very statement-like. He had no expletives. He was very measured. He was very calibrated. So we know Duterte can actually behave himself like a statement. Now, going back to the United States, yes, the United States has provided indispensable support for the Philippines during humanitarian crisis, like the uh, Haiyan crisis in 2013. But if you look at the military assistance that the US is providing, it pales in comparison, way in comparison, when you talk about billions of dollars that Egypt, Pakistan, Jordan, non-treaty allies, non-democracies that have been getting from the U.S., while the Philippines has been getting something around $70 million to $100 plus million. And not to mention some of them Vietnam-era equipment. So there's a sense in the Philippines that, that it has been taken a little bit granted by the United States. Not to mention, when it comes to Senkaku Diaoyu, Obama made it very clear. That's covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. But he never clarified whether the Philippine claims in the South China Sea are covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. So to be fair, I think Duterte is right when he says that the Americans have to be more clear about how far they're willing to support the Philippines in an event of conflict with China. Because if they're not willing to support us all the way, then let's make a deal with China. And this is what we're actually witnessing right now as he visited China and said all of those kinds of controversial statements. Yang Xiu, do you see the day when there'll be more involvement uh, at the military level between China and the Philippines? Uh, well, uh, at the starting point, uh, uh, in short term, I, uh, I cannot see the probability of the exchanges between male to male uh, between the two countries. But with the progresses of the wide range of corporations, I think uh, uh, it will be certain uh, to have a male to male uh, corporations between the two sides from non-conventional area, security areas like uh, uh, 
uh, uh, cracking down criminal, uh, transnational uh, criminal activities to uh, rescue, uh, uh, disaster rescue, and uh, gradually we'll uh, step, step into traditional security area uh, for the male-to-male -male cooperation. Say in gradual way, uh, we will step into the male-to-male -male relationship. Richard, I've just got a little time left, but if we just want to look at one of the reasons why this rupture between the Philippines and the United States started in the first place, it was over U.S. criticism of President Duterte's anti-drugs policy. Um, yeah. Where is that going to go now? Well, first thing first, we have to accept that Duterte is a unique leader. He's one of the very few leaders in Philippine history who has been a self-described socialist, who has expressed criticism of U.S. time and again. When he was the mayor of Davao, he actually refused to grant Americans access to the Davao base for drone operations. So he has a history of tensions with the Americans, not to mention we heard his visa to U.S. was rejected a few years ago. So there are some personal tensions there and some conviction also for a more independent foreign policy. But I think when the U.S. really started to criticize him on the human rights and war and drugs issues, that's where I think he was really ticked off. But if the United States is more calibrated with its criticism of President Duterte, if it does it in a more private way, and in fact, if the U.S. tries to help him in the war on drugs, which is his pet project, and the Chinese have actually been helping him there by providing, for instance, the U.S. can provide assistance in terms of rehabilitation centers. 700,000 people have surrendered as drug users. What can you do with them? The only way to deal with them is creation of rehabilitation centers. And if U.S. helps there, I think we can contain these diplomatic tensions between Duterte and the Obama administration and probably even the next administration. Okay, and we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us.